you. Um, well, after all these wonderful presentations this morning, um, it's kind of hard to to figure out. Okay, what what else can we do? You know, it looks like we are solving the the world now uh, with all these experiments, uh, uh, the inspiring presentation of uh, my colleague James Brainer about the business models. I mean, I I told him I wanted to go out and build my new company after listening to that. I mean, uh, then uh, Leo talking about how popular their size became. And, you know, I said, wow, we're wasting our time. Uh, and now l listening to what uh, uh, these colleagues in Argentina are doing with the hack and hackers, I mean, it makes me feel like, well, maybe there is something, what else can be done? But anyway, so I feel that, uh, first of all, I, I want to tell you where I work is the International Center for Journalists. It's based in Washington, and we have been uh, around for about 20 years, uh, basically working with the media around the world and helping uh, some news organizations, some of them have been mentioned here, to be uh, more independent uh, and to be uh, more professional and to adopt more technology. And that's something that we have been doing in the last few years. Uh, and one of those projects, uh, one of the first thing we realized is that, hey, you know, we need to start providing some media literacy. We need to start, uh, people need to start learning uh, uh, the new language of technology, beginning with the media itself, uh, as Leo mentioned itself. All the media has an owner. I mean. How can they understand this? Uh, is that possible, actually? Um, and in order to, to start saying, OK, what, what can we do? You need to understand the environment where we work right now. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about ICFA, about journalism in Latin America, so we know I mean, what we're talking about. I mean, how can firewall become so popular so fast? How can hack and hackers suddenly say, hey, we got all this data? Who is telling this story? So we need to understand why that's happening or why it's not happening. And then how um, crowdsourcing can be used to actually provide not only information on entertainment or technology, but also on the real problems that face Latin America. Lack of security, you know, corruption issues. How can we improve democracy through those topics? by engaging what we have, which is the mainstream media, and bringing the new technology that allows the crowdsourcing that we see how, you know, how important has become in today's ecos media system. So we'll see how those projects can happen, even though the media has an owner, and there are advertisers that sometimes can push the limit and try to censor the media. How can these people, how can all these stakeholders work together around technology and with the desire of the people to be active participants? So we'll see some of those challenges, but also we'll see th that there are some new and exciting opportunities. And, uh, and I said opportunities very strongly because every time I, come, I go to a conference to talk about the new trends on technology and journalism, the first news that you, or the first words that you say, media is gone. We are in the age of no media, actually. We are in the age of everybody's media. Actually, I think, uh, and at the end you're going to see why I say that, but I think we are at a moment where there are more opportunities than ever before. Not to kill one media over the other, but to basically improve the existing media, and not only that, but create new ones. And I think we are at that moment, exploring those new opportunities. That, so I don't think we are in a, any, any kind of uh, end of the war right now. We are in a new area of great opportunity. So ICFJ is... Uh, has developed uh, many programs around the world. Some of them we have mentioned. We have worked creating the Digital Journalism Center in Guadalajara, Mexico, with Jim Briner. 
um, we are working in India in new ways, improving the way uh, people in the indigenous areas receive information, especially those that uh, do not speak English, but they, they have other languages. And how do we deliver information to people that are illiterate? I mean, they can, they can really read. So how can we empower them with new technology uh, and, and ways and the media to actually reach out to this new audience? So we work in, in those areas. We work on hands-on training. We work on uh, coaching from management to uh, press freedom issues and ethics all around the world. But uh, Latin America, for obvious reasons, is, is in my heart. I'm originally from Panama. Uh, and it's one of the areas where I have worked, you know, over the last 13 years. And you can see the reach of the work where we have. And in, in Latin America, we have done a lot of work with the indigenous uh, communities and the, uh, the radio, community radios as well, and as well as the mainstream media. So my view of what's happening with the media is extremely bro broader and that's why i say there are actually more opportunities but we need to understand how this new technology is actually starting to appear in latin america within a context and that context is no rossi by any means uh, is one of the most dangerous professions in Latin America. So we need to, when we look at what uh, the technology is doing, you need to say, wow, they are doing all this despite the fact. We got uh, over 200 journalists killed in Latin America over the last 10 years. Uh, you have um, a high level of, of, of violence in the region. You have a strong legal restrictions in many countries, despite the fact you would say, but wait a minute, this is, these are countries with, uh, with, with, with democracy, free elected governments. Actually, we have elections this weekend um, in Argentina. How can that happen? Well, there are still many laws in the books that were inherited from the dictatorships area, uh, period. And uh, there are many things that you could be jailed if you say them. So we still have many legal restrictions in the region, but we also have indirect restrictions. Uh, you, could, you have a very, especially in many countries, the media is still highly concentrated. So you could have um, threats with, uh, threaten, uh, the private sector threatened to pull out the ads. If you, if you say something, I experienced that myself when I was a reporter uh, covering big corporations, they certainly cancel the contract. Uh, $200,000 uh, contract because of the stories I was working on, and that continues to happen. Uh, you have lacks of access to information. I mean, we, we, we are talking about that. Now um, our, our colleague uh, uh, Mariano talked about how governments now are trying to basically limit access to public documents. So you would think, but how that can happen in an area where everybody is a media? As uh, Leo reminded us, how can that happen? So that's, that's, I'm giving all this because we need to have a context to what, to, to, to what is happening in the region in terms of media development. So we have a strong tradition. There is a, a strong media. Uh, there is uh, investigative reporting is, is, is improving, but standards are still very low. So there is also a threat that when you use technology, remember, and the social networks, mistakes are also bigger. Because the way people reach out and read, if you made a mistake 15 years ago, well, maybe the breeders around your neighborhood knew what happened. But if you made a mistake now, the impact is a lot bigger. It goes beyond your borders. So standards become extremely important in an area where crowdsourcing is, is taking root. It's extremely important. We talk about the quality of content. So when you still have low standards, we might have uh, a backlash, especially, especially if you are advancing with new technology. So we are on a, uh, uh, there is also an environment of very little political will. Uh, you, you know, we might say, wow, but how can all these entrepreneurs work in a region 
and 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 you you are telling me that there is pol low, low low political will yeah i mean because when you say something there is some consequence so every time i i travel and, and the government asks people luis we got freedom here look at look at how many papers yes but then what happened yeah you let them say whatever they want and use social networks and all that but did they pay the consequence after that well, you know, we can't control that. Well, there's no freedom. <laughs> I mean, you got to pay a consequence to just express what you're saying. We are in problem. So there is no really a, a strong political will. We still have this old um, tradition of secrecy that makes it extremely difficult, especially for the media, uh, uh, to, to do their, their, what they are supposed to do, so which is... Uh, uh, provide information and, and, and basically uh, promote transparency. So we need to understand this to see why what we are doing when we do investigations, when we use technology to cover certain, especially, especially controversial issues, it can become not only a great opportunity uh, for us, but also a great challenge. So we figure, well, the media has always worked, as you know, as they own the truth. They, this is what we think is important for you. So here you go. This is the information. So everybody's like, wow, I mean, why should I believe them? I just want to write what I think on my blog. So we say, well, we can't, we can't, we can't operate in that, in that way anymore. So in Latin America, the media began to think, well, there are, there are other ways. We might kind of have to start partnering. So suddenly, we came up with the idea, OK, why do we work? How can we work with the people, with citizens, NGOs, as uh, Hack and Hacker are, uh, is doing? How can we work with these governments, with the NGOs, with the civil society groups, maintaining our independence? That's probably one of the most difficult questions. Uh, uh, to answer. So we say, well, um, uh, let's, let's, try, let's try coming up with some projects that involve people. And I think we can do it now. If you look at the, at the numbers, I don't want to spend more time on this, but if you look at the numbers, uh, Latin America, you know, South America, Central America, uh, connectivity uh, is still sl uh, uh, low, but is, is, is growing. If you, if you put together South America uh, and Central America, it's is, is pretty, pretty sizable. But remember, when you talk about the Spanish-speaking war, it's now reaching out to the United States, where you have you know, 50 million uh, immigrants and about 30, 30, 30, uh, five, uh, uh, 30, 35 are from, from Latin America. They speak Spanish. So the... the, the the uh, reach of and the, the audience for the Spanish-speaking war is, is beyond just Latin America. There are many, many people living, and I think some of us talk about the diaspora, how important the diaspora is. And I think we need to count on them when we start looking at the numbers. So we, we, we say, well, let, why, why don't we start looking? What are the most difficult issues to tackle for the media and the most important for people right now in Latin America? is issues of crime, corruption. It's probably one of the biggest problems uh, of Latin America right now, is uh, the lack of security. So let's start experimenting. Uh, we, we have a topic that people care about. It's, gonna, it's extremely important for democracy. If we have still these problems, democracy cannot advance. So how can we use new technology to bring the media, the mainstream media, but at the same time bring these civil society groups to promote, uh, uh, cover these issues. And as you say, so you see a lot of the way the media used to cover was just this is the information and this is it. There's no accountability, no transparency, how the facts were gathered, how, peop how you know. That. So the, we, we, we needed to think about, and you look at the, these numbers, you see, uh, security, the perception of security is a big problem, followed by, you know, uh, crimes, you know. Um, uh, this is in, in each country how important, especially in Central America. Um, um, these are some stories that you could find, people, you know, in Honduras, 
uh, uh, lying on the ground there. But then we say the best practices tell us that, as you all know, we need to have public service uh, journalism. And that's the only way you could, you could basically start getting access to people. And you have the tools now, how do we do this better? And one of a very interesting, probably uh, attempt at the beginning of the web was this site that uh, the Digital Center in Guadalajara, one of the students did, was uh, using Facebook to track uh, uh, the uh, uh, service, the, the transportation service, especially the taxes in, in Lima, Peru. Uh, these journalists uh, that work for a paper in, in Peru uh, created a community, a blog where people could basically say where they were uh, having trouble taking a taxi. As you know, in, in, in Peru, uh, transportation is a serious problem. And uh, you have to be careful where you take a cab and what kind of cab you take and where, uh, how you do it. So people began using the social networks to say, hey, don't, don't go to this corner. I mean, this is a cab, this is a number, and this is a problem. Uh, so people start basically sharing their experiences uh, using uh, social network, in this case was Facebook, but also uh, she created a blog that became extremely popular. And, and the, 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 the blog, uh, suddenly government officials be began using it to basically uh, answer questions to the users. So then you, you see a traditional media, a, an independent journalist creating his own blog to start using social network for, social, for, for public service. So we say, well, there is something here that we could be doing uh, better. And actually, because of that interaction, the government, the local government uh, created a, a new system to, to basically license uh, some of these uh, taxes and have a better control over who actually drives a taxi in Lima, Peru. So the, we say, well, there is an impact here in society. We need to maximize this and how we can make this partnership. And then you start looking at some other examples in other countries where uh, websites, very simple websites, where basically using information from, from citizens. And then you start looking at other experiments where um, uh, this uh, website, Verdad Abierta, that recently won a very important war, uh, the Simón Bolívar, which is a very important uh, award in the Spanish-speaking war, uh, because this website is, is again, is a, is a combination of, of uh, uh, a group of journalists and the mainstream media to track, uh, to basically document the history of violence in Colombia. Uh, as you know, there, there is a history of violence, and how can they document what's happening from citizens? And this is, again, what I see, one of those practices where the media could actually start working with, uh, with uh, civil society groups. Well, El Faro is, as you know, we talk about El Faro, uh, have uh, started doing a lot more of that, especially in, in issues of immigration, covering immigration. Uh, Contravia, this is another website, uh, uh, that comes from the NGO, but also report uh, on the violence in Colombia. Uh, again, you know, it's a combination of non-profit with uh, a partnership with the media, with the mainstream media. And uh, this one uh, is an interesting partnership again. Uh, but we, we had a program in Brazil how do we use the favelas in Brazil? How can we get empower people, uh, uh, the youth in, in, in these poor neighborhoods to actually be part of the mainstream media? Uh, so we, we started a program to train them uh, uh, through one of our uh, fellowship programs, which is the Night International Press Fellowship Program that uh, sends experts to help local media. And uh, interesting enough, these, uh, the communities, uh, 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 were trained, they created their blog, and now the blog is part of the uh, FOIA, one of the biggest papers in Brazil. So basically we help uh, bridge this gap of the mainstream media with the communities, in this case, in this case uh, poor neighborhoods, to bring information that before was not reported. So there were, we started looking at ways that now building the communities and working with the mainstream media is possible. Because I, I, I truly believe that to adopt new technology and to improve 
journalism, you don't, you don't have to destroy what is already there. I think there are ways to work with the existing uh, media structure and create new ways to produce information at the same time. I think there is extremely valuable. Someone needs to verify information independently. Uh, uh, citizens would always be great to gather data and to tell you what's going on because the mainstream media cannot be everywhere and to basically give you an independent view of an, an issue. But someone needs to put this together in a, in, a, in a professional way and make sense of the information. So we th I always think that all these new projects, blocks, could easily become their own, but also could also be part of a, a media structure that decays us morale in, in Brazil. So an interesting experiment that I want to spend some time to talk about is Mi Panama Transparente. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, a project that also was developed by one of our fellows, Jorge Luis Sierra, uh, who is from Mexico. And uh, uh, we basically say, OK, what tools do we have out there that could track people's information? So we started using Ushahidi. Uh, uh, you might probably be familiar with the mapping system that allows people to send information via text messages, uh, and, uh, social networks, and, and, uh, and you know, Twitter and, and emails, and start talking about, OK, how can we, instead of using the mapping system just in cases of disaster uh, or, or in cases of, of human rights abuses, as it was uh, created for, uh, how can we actually use this to produce information on crime and corruption, which is what people care the most in Latin America, um, to make their life a little bit better? So we say, well, we need to create a partnership. This is something that the media cannot do al alone. We, we, we were talking about it. We need the citizens to buy into this. We need to talk with uh, organizations that could actually help us promote this. The media cannot do it by themselves. So we, <coughs> we put together a, a, a group of uh, uh, journalists, uh, journalism groups. Uh, we talked to uh, the telecom companies that could provide the short code. Uh, as you see, there is always a risk, okay, but the telecom company won't be, you know, could censor the information. You gotta have a partnership here in order to make this happen. So we created and we created groups. I mean, what are the, the, the cases that happen the most uh, in the country, you know, from, uh, you know, regular corruption cases to, you know, big scandals to armed robberies. And, and so on. So we, we classify as yes, and we say, well, let's let's see what what happened with this, and we start using, you know, the example that 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 you said is uh, done in other parts of the war, and I said, you know, that have been using Haiti and so on, and the United States has been used now to to report on crime. So I said, well, let's put this into the context in Latin America and see what happened. This is a, another example that's been using in Guatemala, but uh, using uh, Google. But it's, uh, it's also about the same thing. It's, uh, it's about crime and corruption. <coughs> and, and this is another example uh, about uh, the media trying to get people to send them information, but in a very, you know, in a way where, where we, we cannot analyze the content, just the information that they send. Uh, so we created the, the, the platform, Mi Panama Transparente. We, on the first, um, the first year we began, uh, I mean, we, it was impressive to see the amount of information that we got. Uh, we got most of them uh, via the web, but we also got from uh, via chats and, and text messages. Most of the information you could see <coughs> was about corruption. Uh, then was fraud. There is a lot of cases of fraud. And the idea was that all this information, the media was going to take it and make investigations out of this report. Because that's the main problem that we have, is that you get in citizens' information, but how do we make sense of this? Who is going to follow this? So that's why we had to partner with the media, with the most 
prestigious media in the country. So journalists could actually follow on the tips of the people. And that was very interesting because when people started looking that that information was actually being reported on the media, that's when the whole site began to have some legitimacy. Because if you have just a website and you know people react that way, that just report what they say in a text, but there is no really more voices talking about their cases, they easily lose interest and the whole idea gets, gets lost. People want to see their, their cases on the big media. So that's why I think we are still in that transition where the media still is important and the partnerships is, is part of this transition that is required to have reliable information. So it was very interesting to see, and, and we, th I mean, we thought about you starting this because remember, there is a big issue with safety in these countries, as I said. So who wants to send information? I mean, I might send information about what's the the coolest gadget, and I don't care if something's gonna happen. I mean, this is what I think. But if I tell you about a corruption case or a, a case of, of, you know, a criminal case. I mean, I'm gonna be afraid. I could be afraid of actually telling you that. So the idea that this was, uh, we told the, the, the users that this is uh, anonymous and if the data is important, we got a, there's an editor that works just for the site. Uh, the group, the association, the science someone that basically go through this, the, the, the reports and kind of try to verify the information. And once it verify, you know, we, 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 we check it as verified. And then if the, the, the information is extremely important, one of the local media picks it up and do a bigger story out of it. And that's why the site has become so important. This is a little bit uh, high of uh, of how the cases are distributed. There, you know, there are you know drug trafficking cases, uh, kidnapping cases, uh, fraud, armed robberies. Uh, but still, people were afraid. We say, well, why? We feel that the people were afraid. Certain old technology still hasn't uh, managed to truly have a site that is totally encrypted. And there were, at the beginning of the project, some glitches. There were, uh, one of the users found one of the reports that sent on doing a search. And we said, we, we gotta fix this. So we, we, we improved the security of the site, but uh, there is a lot more that needs to be done. And I think this is a, a, a work I'm gonna talk more about later, about uh, safety issues. I think that's one of the one of the biggest challenges of the future. Is how do you provide uh, certain uh, security uh, to people, especially when we are dealing with topics highly controversial and difficult? I mean, when when we talk about entertainment, that's easy. Even if you talk about documents that the government gives you, well, that was supposed to be public anyway. Uh, so let's publish. That's not a problem. But when you're start dealing with citizens report that's when things can get tricky so we we uh, um, through the program we recently launched a campaign we said we need more we need more people need to know more about this because we all feel that nowadays everybody should be able to know everything I mean everything is on the web everything is on Facebook well people are supposed to know everything well, uh, let me tell you, believe it or not, nowadays on this information age, I would say that not everybody is really informed because now we are living in a period where there is basically an overflow of information. We were just talking about that a few minutes ago. I, I think I know everything, but it's just impossible because the amount of information that we get is hard to follow. So we thought that it was important to launch a campaign and with the partnership with the media, the local media and citizen groups, the a campaign was launched. And sure enough, you could see that the days of the campaign 
the reports were flowing like crazy. You still need the old ways of promoting when you are dealing with news and information. You, you can see the peak of people visiting the site immediately. So we thought, well, we still need the old way sometimes to promote information in today's society. So based on, on that experience, we, we figure that we, uh, we are in a moment where we, the project is going to a new stage. We are using the experience that we had in Panama and uh, through the night program, uh, the fellows started working in Mexico with this project and uh, partnerships have been worked out right now to launch uh, in Mexico Transparente uh, and in Colombia as well. So I think the uh, idea of pro pro using the web uh, to basically tackle real difficult problems of certain societies is, is essential, but it's, young, it's, all, it's difficult, but it's possible. But we still need to solve some problems. Why? One of the things is how do we protect citizens? I mean, more and more, you all were telling me that the information you're gathering from the radio stations in West Africa to the tech websites in Chile, all of them use user-generated content. But, but when you start dealing with problems of society, like corruption and crime, safety is a big issue. So one of the big challenges is going to be how do we protect citizens, um, more open source software uh, designed to protect data. I think that's uh, something that uh, our colleagues from uh, Media Fabrics are working on. Uh, but that, that's, that's, uh, that's something else that we need to do uh, and be more, uh, more proactive in that. I, I, I think right now most of what's being developed is how do we protect our own sites from uh, cyber attacks. But I think this issue of security on the net needs to be also democratize. We need to develop tools that citizens could use to protect their own communication. It's, it's a more proactive approach than just we protecting our sites, especially if we want to talk about those issues. We need to improve data visualization. There is a, a, a big problem. I mean, uh, we, we, we see all the projects now. Uh, how do we get data? We are going to have all the data. But if we don't have tools to visualize this in a way that people can read them, we will never going to make progress. So I think that needs to be improved, especially in developing countries where there is a huge digital gap. Uh, and this combined with the lack of openness and, and lack of governments is a, is a real problem. Uh, we, we, we just heard about the case of uh, Argentina. You know, how, how can we make this possible? We need to improve capacity of, of data analytics, and this is something we're going to be doing on the project in, in Mexico, where uh, we're going to be trying to use uh, SI uh, uh, that basically uh, improves the way the data is gathered and, uh, and analyzes uh, all the data from the reports from the citizens in a way that is easy to understandable uh, and easy to read for, for, for the audience. Uh, we need to do more citizen uh, digital literacy. I think people are going to have to be more engaged if we, if we want to move to the next level in information in Latin America. There is a, 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 a true lack of understanding of the potential of the web, uh, not only from the media, but I think we need to start engaging the citizens. That's a big issue. And, and training of these tools is extremely important, and I think this is one of those uh, more of these kind of events is going to have to be more open and, and basically go, go uh, town to town, basically, I would say. Door to door is going to have to be the, 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 the way to do it. Uh, and I think uh, this is City Vox, what I'm talking about, that, that uh, we might uh, start working and using it to basically analyze data from citizens and make uh, work from the journalists uh, easier. Uh, 
and and uh, this is another tool i think you guys might know him uh, that basically allows you to put uh, the data and he, he creates the charts and the visualization a lot easier uh, those are those are tools i think we're going to have to start exploring with them a little bit more in the future and make it more available to people um, Final point, I want to all invite you to visit the IGNet.org. If you do not get that, you should get it. It's a clearing house for media assistance, news, and information from around the world. Uh, it basically is published in seven languages. Uh, and, and, and it's basically uh, a, a tremendous tool to get all what, I, what, what we have heard here. I think um, you will find it here in all those languages I'm also uh, in seven languages but also you could uh, kind of uh, be on top of what's going on in terms of training and assistance to the media around the world uh, but thank you very much